Hello class, in today's lecture, we'll be covering the topic evaluating a company's resources, capabilities and competitiveness. In our last lecture, we have learned how to use various tools to assess the external environment of a company. This lecture will diagnose the internal environment of a company, which comprises resources and capabilities. It will also examine the link between a company's resources and capabilities with its competitiveness. Combining internal and external analysis enables a company to adjust its vision, mission and objectives. This would guide firm on identifying the best strategy to reposition a firm, take advantage of new opportunities and cope with emerging competitive threats. These are the learning objectives for today's lecture. For the first learning objective, we will be identifying indicators or measures that reflect how well a firm strategy is working. Next, we will be learning the SWOT framework to assess a company's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We will also be identifying a firm's resources and capabilities and examining their relationships with competitiveness. Thereafter, we will be grasping the concept of value chain activities and their effect on a company's effectiveness, efficiency and effectiveness. Finally, we'll be learning a tool that allows a company to evaluate a firm's internal environment which can assist managers in making critical decisions about their next strategic moves. These are the learning or lesson outline and their respective learning objectives. Each section corresponds with a learning objective. Our first learning objective is to identify indicators or measures that reflect how well a firm's strategy is working. Here are the three best indicators. A way to determine if a company's strategy is working is to evaluate if the company has met its, its financial and strategic objectives. Meeting both leading and lagging objectives would provide some indication that a company's strategy is working. However, these internal objectives are mainly set by the managers of a company which are subjective. It does not tell us how well a company's strategy is working against other competitors. Recall that the definition of a strategy is to outperform a firm's rivals. Therefore, these objectives should be compared with a company's competitors. This leads to the second indicator, which is to compare a company's financial performance with the industry's average. By doing so, we would be able to know if a company is performing better than an average competitor. The third indicator is to determine whether there has been a growth in the company's market share. This would tell us if the company is doing better than its competitors. This figure refreshes our memory on what is a strategy. With reference to lecture one, strategy is defined as an action plan. That is a coordinated set of actions to outperform a company's rivals and gain superior profitability. Strategy consists of moves to respond to changing conditions in the macro environment or in industry and competitive conditions. This section was covered in the previous lecture. It includes strategies to shield a firm from as many competitive pressures as possible or initiate moves to shift the pressures to a company's favor. Also, if an industry is determined to be profitable, we would want to invest aggressively into the industry. If it's not profitable, we may want to sell the business or invest in other industries. 
Strategy also consists of initiatives to build competitive advantage. This was covered in lecture one. We should formulate strategies to build either efficiency or effectiveness. We should also decide on the scope of the competition, which is choosing between a broad strategy or a niche strategy. These two components relate to a firm's scope of operations. They include deciding on the geographical coverage and entering into partnership or alliances. We will cover these in Chapter 6. Lastly, strategy can also be understood at a functional level. This was covered in Lecture 2. There are many layers of strategy within a company. At the top, there is corporate level strategy followed by business level strategy, functional level strategy, and lastly, operational or operation level strategy. These are some examples of functional level strategy. To determine the effectiveness of these strategies, we, should ne we would need to rely on these key indicators. The specific indicators are provided here on this slide. These indicators comprise financial indicators such as sales and earning growths, stock price trends and overall financial strength. They also comprise strategic indicators such as customer retention rate and rate of new customers acquired. They also consist of internal process indicators such as defect rate, order fulfillment, delivery times, days of inventory, and employee productivity. In the context of shipping, defect rate can be understood as the ratio of late or failed delivery versus total delivery. Order fulfillment can be understood as the number of orders completed in a day. Delivery time refer to the speed of the shipment. Days of inventory are not relevant for shipping. Employee productivity can be understood as how many customers a service staff serve in an hour. All in all, these indicators resonate with the balance scorecard that we have learned in lecture two. It covers both financial and strategic objectives. Our second learning objective for today is to apply the SWOT framework to assess a company's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. SWOT analysis is a tool for identifying situational reasons underlying a firm's performance. From conducting SWOT analysis, it explains to us why a company is, is achieving its performance today. SWOT analysis analyzes two internal components, which are a firm's strengths and weaknesses. A firm's strengths should be used as a basis for developing strategy. The strengths of a company come from its resources and capabilities. A firm's weakness refers to resources and capabilities that it does not possess or perform poorly. Market opportunities are potentials in the market that a firm should pursue. They represent strategic objectives that a firm should endeavor to pursue. Lastly, external threats are negative forces found in the macro environment or a firm's immediate competitive landscape that could affect a, firm, a firm's competitive position or profits. To analyze the strengths of a company, we examine the resources and capabilities that a company possess. The difference between resources and capabilities will be explained later in the lecture. From this pool of resources and capabilities, 
we identify those that qualifies as competence, core competence, or distinctive competence. A capability qualifies as a competence, also known as true capability, if a company can perform it proficiently and at and at acceptable cost. For example, some capabilities in the port industry could be cargo handling capability. In the case of shipping, some capabilities could be customer service, crew management, operations management, and bunker management. A competence qualifies as a core competence if it is central to a firm's strategy and competitive success. In shipping, a core competence would be bunker management. Bunker represents a significant cost for ship owners. By being able to perform bunker management proficiently, it is central to reducing ship owners' cost of operations, which might be crucial to the strategy of achieving a low-cost competitive advantage. For the port industry, a core competence would be cargo handling capability. Our port in Singapore is still the preferred choice as compared to Port Tanjong Pelapas in Malaysia. It is due to the fact that it is highly efficient in its cargo handling operation. Ships spend less unproductive time performing loading and unloading in ports. Therefore, cargo handling capability can be regarded as a core competence for PSA, our Singapore port operator. Finally, a core competence qualifies as a distinctive competence if a firm can perform better than its rival. In our earlier example, cargo handling capability can be regarded as a distinctive competence for PSA as it is performing better than its rival. To analyze the weaknesses of a company, we examine again the resources and capabilities that a company is lacking or does poorly and hence putting it in a competitive disadvantage. For example, cargo handling capability is a weakness for Port Tanjong Palapas because it is performing poorly compared to PSA. The types of weaknesses are listed here. They relate to a firm's resources and capabilities. Market opportunities can be plentiful or scarce depending on the industry. For technology, energy or health industries, there will be more opportunities. Whereas for sunset industries, for example, the CD or VCR industries, opportunities will be limited. Very often, opportunities are hidden. It is up to the firms to identify or create the opportunities. Opportunities can also evolve in mature markets, for example, the bubble tea industry. New products such as brown sugar milk, yogurt drink, and fruit tea are introduced into the market to delight customers. It should be noted that not all opportunities should be pursued by a firm. A firm should only pursue those opportunities that are aligned with its strengths, that is, its resources and capabilities. The same in life, where we will not pursue a career that we have absolutely no knowledge or competencies. There are two types of external threats. The first type of threat is the normal cause of business threats. For example, the ups and downs of our business cycle, representing a series of economic recessions and booms. The same applies to seasonal cycles. For example, the, during the summer season, it is, a it is a threat for retailers selling winter clothing and the energy market but these threats are th treated as normal cause of business threats. 
The second type of threat is sudden death, which consists of crises or events that are unexpected and devastating. For example, the financial crisis in 2008-2009 or the recent COVID-19 pandemic can be considered as sudden death threats. Threats should be treated and managed seriously by companies to evaluate their future prospects. As covered in our last lecture, threats are external competitive pressure and companies should try to neutralize or lessen the impact of the threat. The table compiles some examples of a company's strengths and weaknesses. As mentioned earlier, strengths represent a firm's resources or capabilities. There are many different degree of capabilities, which are competence, core competence, and distinctive competence. Some of the strengths would include ample financial resources because they allow companies to grow its businesses. A strong brand name or reputation will allow a company to charge its products or services higher. Similarly, a cost advantage over rivals allows a company to outprice its rivals. Having propi proprietary technology, superior technological skills and patents are also valuable resources and capabilities for a business. Weaknesses would represent resources and capabilities that a firm does not possess or performs poorly. They are the opposite of a firm's strength. For example, weak balance sheet, weak brand image or reputation, or having a higher cost than competitors. The SWOT analysis involves more than listing a company's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. The analysis should be used by the company to craft strategies with the objective to gain a sustainable competitive advantage in the market. New strategy can be formulated to apply a firm's strengths to seize new opportunities, correct weaknesses and neutralize a threat. In addition, SWOT analysis gives insights into whether some of the firm's existing strategies are effective or relevant. If they are no longer relevant, they should be abandoned or revised. This figure reinforces the previous slide. Importantly, conclusions should be drawn from conducting a SWOT analysis. The following questions should be asked after the list of strengths, weaknesses, market opportunities and threats have been identified. Number one, what are the underlying reasons for the success or failure of a company's strategy? This is mainly contributed by a company's strengths and weaknesses. Number two, what are the attractive and unattractive aspects of the company's situation? and this is mainly contributed by opportunities and threat. In addition to drawing conclusions, implications for improving a company's strategy should be developed. Here are some principles that we should follow. Use company strengths as a foundation for strategy. Support weaknesses that are interfering with success. Use strengths to lessen the impact of threats. Pursue market opportunities that are aligned with strengths. Correct weaknesses that impair a company's pursuit of important market opportunities. And repair weaknesses that increase the vulnerability of external threats. We will now move on to our third learning objective, which involves identifying a firm's resources and capabilities and their collective contribution to the competitive advantage of a firm. We shall first look at the importance of a firm's resources and capabilities as well as their differences. A firm's resources and capabilities reflect a firm's competitive assets or in other words strengths. Consequently, they determine the competitiveness and the ability to succeed in the marketplace. The effectiveness of a firm's strategy depends on its resources and capabilities 
to develop sustainable competitive advantage over its rivals. For example, if a, ship, if a shipping company's strategy is to build economies of scale through mergers and acquisition, its ability to successfully merge and acquire other companies and reap benefits from the merger and acquisition will depend on several resources and capabilities. These include financial resources, managers' knowledge, experiences and expertise in integrating physical assets and IT resources of both companies, leadership and company culture. This slide shows the difference between a resource and a capability. A resource is a productive input or an asset that is needed to produce products and services. They are owned by, they are owned or controlled by a firm. The productive input or asset can be tangible or intangible. Example, a fleet of oil tankers, land, capital, labor, and IT resources are all examples of resources which are necessary to produce an output such as shipping service. A capability is a capacity or ability of a firm to perform activities proficiently. It normally refers to skills such as superior skills in marketing, bunker management, operations management, ship routing and planning. To recap, a capability qualifies as a competence if it is performed at acceptable cost. A competence qualifies as a core competence if it is central to a firm's strategy or competitiveness. Finally, a core competence qualifies as a distinctive competence if it outperforms rivals. A firm's resources can be tangible or intangible. Here are some examples of tangible resources such as physical resources, example land, plants and equipment, Financial resources, example cash and securities, technological assets such as patents and copyrights, and organizational resources, example IT and communication systems, and other planning, coordination, and control systems. A firm's resources can also be intangible, that is, cannot be touched, seen, or felt. These include resources such as human assets and intellectual capital, example, education, experience, knowledge, and talent, brands, company image and reputational assets, example, brand names, trademarks, or image. Relationships, example, alliances, joint ventures or partnership, and company culture and incentive system, example, norms of behavior, business principles, and ingrained belief with the, within the company. Unlike resources, capabilities are skills which are intangible. They are often developed using a combination of resources. Therefore, a capability is also known as a resource bundle. We need various resources to develop a capability. For example, bunker management is a capability that draws on a firm's multiple resources. This includes knowledge from the bunker department, 
to determine the best location to purchase the cheapest bunker. We also need the knowledge and experience from the operations department to determine the optimum route for the ships to refuel. We also require input from the procurement department, in particular its relationships with bunker suppliers to bargain for discounts. In addition, a capability is knowledge-based. It means that the capability resides in people and in a firm's intellectual capital, example relationships, organizational process and systems embodying toxic knowledge. Toxic knowledge means that it is not easy to transfer a capability to another person through simple communication or instructions. The capability is developed or built from years of personal learning, interaction with other people, and accumulation of experience. We will now look at the methods that we can use to evaluate the competitive power or superiority of a company's resources and capabilities. One way, to look into the one way is to look into the value price cost framework that we have learned in chapter 1. Essentially, the superiority of a company's resource or capability is determined by how much it increases the value of a product and how much it reduces the cost of a firm. The difference between value and cost is known as the total economic value produced by a firm. The larger is the total economic value, the more superior is a company's resources and capabilities. It also means that these resources or capabilities are more capable of producing a sustainable competitive advantage over a company's rival and hence far greater profit potential. Apart from using the total economic value to evaluate the competitive power of a company's resources and capabilities, another method is to use the VRIN test. According to this test, a company's resource or capability will confer a sustainable competitive advantage to a company if it is valuable, rare, inimitable and non-substitutable. Valuable means that the resource or capability can help increase the value or reduce the cost of a company's products or service. Rare means that the resource or capability is unique, something that rivals do not have. Inimitable means that the resource or capability is hard to copy by rivals. Non-substitutable means that the resource or capability cannot be substituted by other resources or capabilities. If a resource or capability only passes the first two tests, it only confers a company a competitive advantage. In this case, the advantage is only temporary. This is because rivals can easily copy the resource or capability or find substitutes for it. Only when a resource or capability passes all four tests, it will confer a company a sustainable competitive advantage because this resource of capability is valuable and possessed only by the company. Further, there is no way that the rivals can copy or substitute the resource or capability. So why are some resources or capabilities hard to copy or imitate? The reasons are due to the following factors, social complexity and causal ambiguity. Some resources or capabilities exhibit social complexity, such as a firm's culture, interpersonal relationships between managers or teams, and trust-based relationships with customers, 
or suppliers. This can only be developed over a long period and cannot be immediately imitated by rivals. Some resources or capabilities exhibit causal ambiguity because they are too complex for competitors to understand how to imitate them. This is especially true for those resources or capabilities that are intangible and contain a bundle of resources. Due to the unobservable nature and complex interactions between the resources, it is more difficult for rivals to understand how to develop them. We will now look into the role of a specific type of capability, which is dynamic capability. The reason why we need to develop dynamic capabilities are because a company's resources and capabilities constantly face threats from rivals who are developing better substitutes over time. Another reason is that current resource and capabilities do depreciate over time due to neglect. Example, certain IT skills become irrelevant or obsolete if we do not constantly train and upgrade them. Another reason is because of disruptions, example, blockchains and autonomous ships that constantly shape the competitive environment. In that case, it is important that companies manage their resources and capabilities dynamically by performing, performing un, ongoing modifications of existing resources and capabilities and developing new capabilities to align themselves with the changing environment. We label this ongoing effort to manage a firm's existing resources and capabilities as a dynamic capability. A dynamic capability is the ongoing capacity of a firm to modify its resources and capabilities or create new ones. This dynamic capability resonates with the continuous improvement principle that we have learned from quality management. Essentially, a dynamic capability entails improving existing resources and capabilities incrementally and adding new resources and capabilities to a firm's competitive asset portfolio. We will now look at what are value chain activities and their impact on the firm's efficiency and effectiveness. We will be skipping this slide. Value chain identifies the primary activities and related support activities that create customer value. It identifies the inner workings. In other words, it explains a firm value proposition and business model. If you can recall, a business model covers two important concepts, which are value proposition and profit formula. They relate to the value price cost framework. Value chain tells a company why it is achieving certain value or cost today. Value chain also permits a deeper look at the firm's cost structure and its ability to profitably offer low prices. It tells us the makeup of a firm's cost by looking into the cost of different value chain activities. Therefore, it reveals how efficient a firm is. It also gives insights into the activities of a firm that enhances its differentiation capabilities, which refers to a firm's effectiveness. These differentiation capabilities enhance the value of a firm's products and services, allowing the firm to charge higher prices. As mentioned in the previous slide, a company's value chain consists of two broad categories of activities. The primary activities, which are crucial in creating value for customers, and the support activities that facilitate the, and enhance the performance of primary activities.
Having understood what is a value chain, we consist, which consists of primary and support activities, we'll now look at what value chain analysis constitutes. Value chain analysis involves a comparison, activity by activity, of how effectively and efficiently a firm delivers value to its customers relative to its competitors. The analysis process involves identifying the primary and support activities necessary to, product, to produce a product or service. Thereafter, we determine the cost of each primary and support activities to produce a product or service, the profit margin, and the value perceived by customers. We will then repeat the above two steps for our competitors. This allows a company to compare the cost of its activities against those of its competitors to measure its efficiency relative to competitor. Also, it allows a company to compare the profit margin which is also known as profit formula in the business model relative to competitor. In addition, it also allows a comparison of the value of a firm's products and services against its competitors. We now introduce a new term, which is the industry value chain, which includes internal value chain, which was discussed in the previous slide, value chains of upstream industry suppliers and value chains of forward channel intermediaries. Collectively, they form the value chain system. It should be noted that a firm's cost, profit margin and value depend not only on its internal value chain activities but also its upstream and downstream partners. The costs of suppliers and channel partners can affect prices to end consumers. Further, activities of channel partners can affect industry sales volumes and customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction has an influence on the value of the product or service. Therefore, the term industry value chain has been developed that considers the cost, profit margin and value of all value chain activities from the firm, suppliers and channel distributor. This will provide a more complete picture of the efficiency and effectiveness of a firm in the production of products or services. The figure shows the value chain system or industry value chain. Essentially, we would want to find out the internal and external value chain costs to have a more complete assessment and comparison with competitors. We are also interested in finding out the profit margin and value of the product or service perceived by the buyer or end user. This figure shows only the cost for various external and internal value chain activities performed by Boy, Bowl and Branch and its profit margin. The perceived value of its product is not shown in this figure. The perceived value of a product is only known by conducting a survey on customers and asking them how much they would value the product. Referring to this example, to produce a king size bed sheet. These are the internal value chain activities which include the cost of material, raw cotton, spinning, cutting, transportation and factory fee. The following are the external value chain activities which include inspection fees, ocean freight, import duties, warehousing, packaging, 
customer shipping and promotion. Summing all these costs will allow the company to determine its total cost, which is about $154. Because Bow & Branch applies a 60% markup, its final price will be $250. What Bow & Branch will want to do next is to find out the respective cost of its competitors so that the cost of each activity can be compared. This allows Bow & Branch to find out which activity it is doing poorly or better than its competitors. Consequently, Bow & Branch can work on improving those activities that it is performing badly by learning from its competitors. This process of activity by activity comparison and learning is what we call benchmarking. Benchmarking seeks to improve internal activities based on learning from other companies' best practices. It assesses whether the cost competitiveness and effectiveness of a company's value chain activities are in line with its competitors' activities. Below are some sources where companies can obtain the cost information of competitors. They include market data reports from consulting companies and market analysts, analyst, publications of industry trade groups and government agencies and customers. There are also benchmark firms available in the market to help companies to conduct such comparisons. We will be skipping this slide. Due to the importance of value chain activities in contributing to a firm's efficiency and effectiveness, performing value chain activities in itself can be viewed as a capability that can confer a company a competitive advantage over its rivals. There are two options available for a company to develop its capability in performing value chain activities. The first option is to develop capabilities to perform value chain activities effectively by creating more customer value for a differentiation based competitive advantage. First, managers need to decide what kind of differentiation attributes that they wish to pursue. The attributes can be based on quality, features, performance, or other differentiation enhancing aspect. For, for example, a shipping company might want to differentiate based on the reliability of its services. Next, managers would need to focus on reconfiguring realigning and improving the performance of its value chain activities. The purpose is to develop the desired quality features and performance. Over time, competencies or competence shall emerge in performing the value chain activities. Again, constant reconfiguring, realigning and improving the differentiation enhancing activities will rise to the level of core competence and consequently distinctive competence. This means that the company is now able to perform value, value chain activities more effectively than its rivals. Finally, because the company is performing its value chain activities more effectively than its rival, it now has a competitive advantage over its rivals based on superior differentiation capabilities. The second option is to develop a firm's capability in performing value chain activities efficiently to build a cost-based competitive advantage. First, managers need would need to find ways to perform value chain activities in the most cost efficient manner. Next, managers would need to focus on reconfiguring, realigning and improving the performance of its value chain activities as efficient as possible to drive down the cost of value chain activities. Over time, competence shall emerge in performing the value chain activities.
activities. This constant pursuit of driving down the cost of value chain activities would then lead to a core competence and then a distinctive competence which means that a firm is now able to perform value chain activities at a low at a lower cost than its rival. Because the firm is now able to perform value chain activities at a lower cost than its rivals, the firm has a cost-based advantage over its rival. Apart from value chain analysis, a firm can use competitive strength analysis which is also a tool to determine whether they are strong or weaker than its key rivals. When assessing a firm's overall competitive strength, we can ask the following questions. How does the firm rank relative to competitors on each of the important factors that determine market success? Does the firm have a net competitive advantage or disadvantage versus major competitors? Here are the steps to conduct a competitive strength assessment. The first step is to list the industry key success factors and measures of competitive strength or weakness. If you can recall, key success factors are covered in our last lecture. They represent number one, crucial product attributes and service characteristics. Number two, resources and capabilities that a company, company must have to be successful and three so shortcomings that will put a firm at a significant disadvantage. As shown here, these are the list of key success factors necessary for a hypo hypothetical firm to succeed in the market. The next step is to assign weights to each key success factors based on their importance. As shown here, the importance of each factor is given a value so that they add up to 1 or 100%. The next step is to score competitors on each key success factors and multiply the score by each measure the, multiply the score of each measure by its corresponding weight. In this example, we have three companies. We rate each company on each key success factor on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 means very strong, 1 means very weak. We'll then calculate the weighted score by multiplying the importance weight with the strength rating. For example, the quality performance of ABC is 0 0.1 multiplied by 8, which gives us 0 0.8. The next step is to sum the weighted strength rating on each factor to get an overall measure of competitive strength for each firm. For example, by adding all of the weighted score of ABC, we get a value of 5.95. This value tells us ABC's overall weighted competitive strength weighting. Finally, any analysis is not complete without drawing conclusions and implications for the company. Here are some conclusions and implications that can be obtain, obtained from the competitive strength assessment. The higher a firm's overall weighted strength rating, the stronger its overall competitiveness versus rivals. The rating score indicates the total net competitive advantage for a firm relative to other firms. For example, we can see that ABC has a huge advantage over rival 2 and is slightly weaker than rival 1. Firms with high competitive strength scores are targets for benchmarking. For example, ABC would want to use rival 1 
as the benchmark because of its higher overall strength rating. The ratings show how a firm compares against rivals factor by factor or capability by capability. This will tell ABC which factor it is severely underperforming and find ways to improve on it. For example, ABC is extremely weak in its manufacturing capability, even weaker than Rival 2. This reveals a deficiency or weakness that it must improve. Also, the factor-by-factor -factor comparison reveals its superiority in technological skills. Something that it should continue to work on to maintain its advantage over its rivals. Strength scores can be useful in deciding what strategic moves to make. For example, it is clear that ABC would need to work hard to catch up on rival 1. It should also formulate strategies to strengthen its manufacturing capability, which is a glaring weakness and perhaps also on its relative cost position. Relative cost position has a very high importance weight, but ABC is only performing mediocrely in this aspect. To recap, we have learned how to evaluate how well a firm's strategy is working. There are three key indicators that we can use. They are number one, a firm's stated financial and strategic objectives. Number two, a firm's financial performance relative to the industry average. And three, growth in market share. We have also learned how to assess the company's strengths and weaknesses in light of market opportunities and external threats. Strengths comprise a firm's valuable resources and capabilities that it controls, whereas weaknesses comprises resources and capabilities that a firm lack or perform poorly. Opportunities are potential in the market that should be pursued by a company if it has the required resources and capabilities to do so. Threats are competitive threats or forces that could affect the competitiveness or profitability of a company. We have also learned why a company's resources and capabilities are critical in gaining a competitive edge over rivals. For this learning objective, we have learned the differences between a resource and a capability. A resource is a productive input or an asset necessary to produce goods and services. A capability refers to skills, capacity or ability of a firm to perform an activity proficiently. A capability is also a competence if a firm can perform it at acceptable cost. A, a competence is a core competence if it is central to a firm's strategy or competitiveness. Lastly, a core competence is a distinctive competence if a firm can perform it better than its rivals. Resource, resources and capabilities will contribute to a firm's competitive advantage if they pass the VRIN test. It, if a resource or capability passes the valu valuable and rarity test, it will only confer a temporary competitive advantage to a firm. If it passes all four tests, that is, valuable, rarity, inimitable, and non-substitutable test, then it will confer a sustainable competitive advantage to a firm. We have also learned how value chain activities affect a company's cost structure and customer value proposition. Value chain analysis helps companies to identify the primary and support activities necessary to produce a product or service. It also identifies the cost of each activity, profit 
and potentially the value of a firm's products or services. The breakdown of the value chain activities allows companies to perform benchmarking. Profic proficiency in performing value chain activities is a capability and companies could either seek to, to perform value chain activities effectively to create a differentiation based competitive advantage or perform value chain activities efficiently to create a cost based competitive advantage. Finally, we have learned how a comprehensive evaluation of a firm's competitive situation can assist managers in making critical decisions about their strategic moves. Competitive strength analysis identifies, evaluates, and compares a firm's ratings on several key success factors. This allows the firm to evaluate its overall competitiveness against rivals identify its strengths and weaknesses for each key success factor and make strategic moves to correct its weaknesses and improve its strengths. With that, we have come to the end of the lecture. You can refer to chapter 4 of the following textbook to find out more about the lecture today. I'll see you in the next lecture.